Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And then all who heard were amazed, and they said, Isn't this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul, and as they watched the gates day and night to kill him, the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. And then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. The Word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Father, again we thank You for this record of holy boldness by which this new convert, Saul, was used as Your chosen instrument to awaken multitudes of people to Your identity. And we pray for that same kind of boldness in our lives, in our preaching, in our witness, in our own day. Speak to us now through this text, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Just to recapitulate where we've come in our study of the book of Acts, we remember that Saul had left Jerusalem on a mission to root out Christians in Damascus, and he got orders from the high priest that authorized him to drag them from their homes and bring them back. And so he left the city breathing out threats with an entourage, a retinue of mounted soldiers or helpers with him, and he left in strength, but was interrupted on the route to Damascus by the intrusion into his life by the risen Christ. And we looked at that episode in which the Apostle Paul was first converted. And he left Jerusalem in strength. He entered into Damascus being led by the hand because God had struck him blind. And recall that then he had been taken to the street named Straight, where there Ananias ministered to him, laid hands upon him, the Holy Ghost anointed him, and the scales like flakes fell from his eyes, and he was able to see. Then we read in the text this morning that this one who came blind into the city of Damascus, being led by the hand, became so powerful in such a short period of time that he had to leave the city because there was a conspiracy there to kill him, and he left by way of being secreted out a window on the wall of the city and lowered down in a woven basket like so much dirty laundry. So you can imagine the radical shifts in the circumstances and situation of the apostle from the time he first left Jerusalem in power, led in humility into Damascus, and then flees from the city in weakness in a basket that his life may be spared. But in between his entrance into Damascus and his departure by the basket, he had a mighty ministry. 
And I want to spend some time looking specifically at the first statement that Luke tells us about this interim period of the apostolic ministry in Damascus. Immediately, we are told, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I want to stop for a few moments and focus on this, that Paul's message, the moment he began preaching in the synagogues there in Damascus, was about Jesus as the Christ, and he declared to the Jewish people there that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, it's important for us to notice this because this is the only time in the book of Acts that the title Son of God is used for Jesus. For many of you who were involved in our adult education class when we went in a biblical overview from dust to glory, you recall that I spent some amount of time talking about the titles that are given to Jesus in the New Testament, such as the title Christ, the title Lord, and I spent a lot of time on the significance of the title Son of Man, because that's Jesus' favorite title for Himself. Well, we see two titles juxtaposed in the New Testament with respect to Jesus. On the one hand, the title Son of Man, on the other, the title Son of God. And as I've mentioned to you before, it's tempting in light of the church's confession that we believe that Jesus was one person with two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. We reach back into church history to the Council of Chalcedon in the fifth century where the church confessed her faith about Jesus saying that Christ is vera homo, vera deus, truly man, truly God and the two natures perfectly united in one person. Now, that's part of our confession as Christians. But the temptation is to think that when Jesus uses the term Son of Man, that that title refers to His human nature, and when He uses the title Son of God, that that title would refer to His divine nature. But if we draw that conclusion, we will be making a serious error. It's true that when Jesus is called the Son of Man, it has something to do with His human nature. But the principal and chief significance of that title, Son of Man, is that it refers to the Old Testament personage who is a heavenly character, a heavenly person who dwells in the presence of the Ancient of Days, and who is sent from heaven to descend to the earth for a mission. So in a sense, the title Son of Man describes more of Jesus' divine nature than it does His human nature. Likewise, when we come to the title Son of God, we would assume that its primary reference would be to His deity. But again, we would trip over ourselves if we drew that inference without great care. Now, I want to take some time this morning to look at it, because here's how Paul announces Jesus in his beginning of his ministry. He preaches in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. What did he mean? Well, in the Old Testament, that title, Son of God, was used in several ways. In the first instance, the angels of heaven are called the sons of God. And the sons of God in that sense are still creatures. They're not divine beings. Then Israel herself as a nation is called the son of God. Remember the quotation in the New Testament from the old, out of Egypt have I called my son. So in God's redeeming of the people of Israel, He adopted them into His family and called the whole corporate nation His son. Kings in the Old Testament 
were called the sons of God. And also, as the concept of the Messiah developed over time in the Old Testament, the ministry of the Messiah, who would come both as a king and as a suffering servant and so on, also became known as the one who would be known as the Son of God. And so when we get into the New Testament, we hear Jesus at His baptism when He embraces all of the responsibilities to be the Messiah, when He's anointed by the Holy Ghost, God speaks audibly from the clouds and announces to those who are there, this is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then later on, again, God speaks from heaven audibly, saying basically the same message, this is my beloved Son. Hear Him. Listen to Him. And so, what are we to make of this? Well, in the first instance, in the New Testament, the idea of sonship is inseparably related to obedience. Remember the controversies that Jesus had with the Pharisees over their relationship with Abraham. Remember? The Pharisee says, we're the children of Abraham. Jesus says, you are not. (laughs) He said, if you were the children of Abraham, you would do what Abraham would do Abraham, rejoice to see my day, and you reject me every minute. And before Abraham even was, I am. Do you remember that interaction there? And then he said, you're not the children of Abraham, but you are of your father, the devil. Now, that's quite a contrast between being called the children of Abraham and being called children of Satan. Why did Jesus say that these opponents of His were children of the devil? Well, He answers that question for us. He said, you are the children of the one you obey, and you're obeying Satan, not Abraham, not Moses, not God. And since you obey Satan, it can be said that you're the children of Satan. Now, conversely, the same idea is used to describe sonship with respect to Jesus. You are the child of the one whom you obey. Jesus is uniquely the Son of God in the sense that He of all people in history was completely and absolutely obedient to the Father. In His humanity, He was the Son of God. In His humanity, because of His sinlessness and because of His perfect obedience, He warranted this title, the Son of God. And so, we could just stop there and say, well, here, the term Son of God has nothing to say about Jesus' divine nature. It simply refers to His human nature in His perfect obedience. No, 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 no. Because the New Testament, though, it clearly talks about His sonship in terms of obedience, nevertheless goes beyond it to the transcendent aspect of Christ's unique relationship to the Father. Now, some of you will recall when we preached through the gospel of John, that at the very beginning of our study of the gospel of John, in the prologue to the gospel of John, at the end of that, Jesus is described by John as the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. Remember that? Now, that's a loaded term. It doesn't mean the first begotten, but the prefix mono means the uniquely begotten one, 
the only one that ever had been begotten of the Father, the only one that ever will be begotten of the Father, that there is a unique begottenness that is in view there with respect to Jesus. Now, it's that language of begottenness that provoked one of the most serious controversies in all of church history in the fourth century that made it necessary for there to be an ecumenical council of the whole vast expanse of Christendom to come together to Nicaea to meet in council, out of which came the Nicene Creed. Now, just a few moments ago, we stood and we sang the Gloria Patra. Remember that? Sure you do. It wasn't that long ago. And we sang the words, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. And when we sat down, our beloved pastor, Tim, got a little excited after we sang the doxology, and what did he say? Do you remember? Take that, you Arians, because he was referring back to the fourth century dispute when Arius denied the deity of Jesus. Arius said that Jesus was a human being who was uniquely adopted by the Father for His mission, but He was not divine. He was not eternal. He was not of the same substance or essence as God. He was a creature. And how do we know it? Because the Bible says He was begotten. And the Greek verb to beget, gino, genomai, means to be, become, or to happen. And it refers to those incidents and events that indicate the beginning of something in time and in space. And Arius argued from the text that if the Bible says Jesus was begotten, that means He had a beginning. And if He had a beginning, He's not eternal. And if He's not eternal, He's not God. So we ought not to be attributing deity to Christ. That was what the Council of Nicaea was all about. That's what the Nicene Creed was all about. When the Nicene Creed responded with the famous phraseology that Christ was homoousius, of the same substance, the same essence, the same stuff as the Father, declaring the faith of Christendom that Christ is co-substantial and co-eternal with the Father. And then it uses the language of begottenness where it says in the creed that Christ was begotten, comma, not made. In other words, the church acknowledges that the Bible speaks of the begottenness of Jesus, but the begottenness here refers to an eternal relationship, an eternal begottenness that makes it set apart from any other kind of begottenness you ever follow by that term monogenes, that Christ is individually, singularly, the only one ever uniquely begotten eternally of the Father because He is very God of very God. There never was a time when the Son was not. And so the church sang her confession, saying, glory, a divine attribute, glory be to the Father and glory be to the Son, and glory be to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, that is, from all eternity, is still going on. God is still triune. He was always triune, and He evermore shall be triune. He is now and evermore shall be world without end. Amen. It's that radical message, and I use the term radical carefully, coming from the Latin rodex, which means root. It is that root message that the Apostle Paul 
immediately proclaimed. Where he saw Jesus as an enemy to the purity of Jewish monotheistic religion, now it dawned on him that the Messiah of Israel was nothing less than God incarnate. And so when he was preaching in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God, he was using that title in the fullest measure that it could be used to apply to Christ. And of course, when he did that, when he made that declaration, he was met with astonishment and amazement by his ears. First of all, because of his about face, they said, isn't this the one who destroyed everybody who called on this name Jesus in Jerusalem and had come here for that purpose that he might bring him bound to the chief priest? And the answer to that question, ladies and gentlemen, was yes. Yes, this is the same guy. This is the guy who came here to bind the followers of Jesus and drag them back to Jerusalem. And when he left Jerusalem, he didn't come as a one-man vigilante against Christians. He came with the full authorization of the high priest. He came with the warrant for the arrests of Christians issued by the highest authority in Israel, the high priest at Jerusalem. However, something happened between the beginning of that mission and his arrival in Damascus. What happened simply was this. He met the high priest. He met the eternal high priest, the high priest who is high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who will never retire, who will never abdicate his office, who will never leave his office by dying as all the lines of high priests in Israel had one after another. Their term was limited. Their duration was finite. But the high priest changed the orders, gave a new commission, overruled and trumped the high priest in Jerusalem, and gave Paul a whole new mission, which he began to carry out, we are told, immediately. And so first, He was greeted by amazement, but we are told Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. This went on for just a few days until the astonishment of the local Jewish community turned to rage, and they plotted to kill him. But Paul heard of the plot, and we saw already that he escaped their hands by being let down from a house. In those days, the city walls would often include within them homes that were built right on the wall that were part of the wall. And so the friends of Paul took him into the house and dropped him out of the window in this basket in the midst of the night so that he could escape. So we are told when Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they're afraid of him because they still don't know what's taking place. But Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, interceded for Paul, vouched for Paul to the disciples who were gathered here in Jerusalem, and told how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And so, again, we are told he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem and disputing against the Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenists, and then they tried to kill him. But when the disciples found this out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. 
Then this brief interlude, the churches in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, and they were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were mollified. Now, before we heard of the conversion of Saul, following on the martyrdom of St. Stephen, we had heard something of Peter's ministry in Jerusalem. And then we have this brief interval where we're introduced to Saul, read of his conversion and of his brief ministry there in Damascus, and then back to Jerusalem for a short while until he's then sent back to Tarsus. And so then the text goes back, as we will see God willing next week, to focus attention again on Peter and his ministry in Jerusalem before it will pick up afresh later and take us along with Paul and his fellow workers on his missionary journeys. But his ministry began in Damascus. And it began proving that Christ was the Messiah, and it began proclaiming Jesus in His fullness, in His perfect humanity, and His perfect deity as the Son of the living God. And beloved, that's why we're here today. That's why we're assembled in this building because we are people who are persuaded that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. What Paul declared there in Damascus is the same thing that Peter declared before Jesus at the accessory of Philippi confession. You remember when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Simon said, thou art the Christ. the Son of the living God. Beloved, God hates religion because religion is something that humans invent, and religious behavior is something that we conjure up. But what Christianity is about is devotion to our creed, not because it's written down, but because of the substance of the truth that's contained therein. We are to be people who are persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, that God's Son, His only begotten Son, came into this world for us and for our salvation. And we come now each Sabbath day to give the sacrifice of praise, to give honor, to give worship, and to give adoration to Him. Finally, this last thing, one of my things I had to do this week was write a Table Talk article for several months from now. You have to do them in advance, and it's on worship. And I was asked to write about how the nature of God should teach us anything about worship. And I thought back, as Francis Schaeffer, three-fourths of the way through the 20th century, he wrote a book entitled, How Shall We Then Live? Do you remember that? In light of the impact of modernity and postmodernism, Schaefer was musing on that. How are we going to live as Christians in a strange and foreign land in this day and age? How shall we then live? Well, I think the question now is, how shall we then worship? That's the question, How? But if you're a journalist and you're writing a story, you have to look at certain things as you investigate the facts. You want to know the answer to certain questions like who, what, where, when, how, and so on. Well, the big question today is the who question. Who do we worship? Because who we worship defines how we worship. I'll tell you what, I almost cry when I go past churches and I'll see on their advertisement outside, they'll say, 9.30 service, traditional, 11 o'clock service, contemporary. Or I'll see on the sign, our worship is blended. That's the language of the contemporary church. I look at that and I want to weep and I say, why would anybody have blended worship? 
Why would anybody say here? We're a ecclesiastical cafeteria. If you want one style, you come at 9.30. If you want another style, you come at 11. The reason I weep is because I know what's going on. I know what's driving the changes, the church growth movement that asks the question always and everywhere, what do the people want? Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't care what you want. The issue is what does He want? Who is it that we're here for? We're not here to please unbelievers. You can try to reach them in evangelism and during the week, but corporate worship on Sunday morning is for the body of Christ, for believers. And it is for believers to be brought before the living God and to approach Him as one who is holy. So the how question must always be answered by the who question. And that should be true in every aspect of our lives, that how we live our Christian lives should be determined by who we understand God to be and who Jesus is. We have to do with the Son of God. And though we're called to enter boldly into His presence, and that we shouldn't be terrified by Him, And even though God is not only transcendent, but He's imminent, and He's close to us, and He dwells with us, and He comforts us and says, come ye to us, He never, ever, ever, as close as we get to Him, and as nice as He is to us, and as nice that we can call Him Father and all of that, He never stops being holy. And that should be manifested in how we worship Him. Because I believe that how people worship God speaks louder about their understanding of who He is than any creed or any theology that could ever be written. God grant that the people of St. Andrews will know who He is and who it is we have to do when we enter into His house with the sacrifice of praise. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we have trivialized who You are. We have failed to show reverence and awe before You. We have not regarded the sanctuary as a holy place. We have not regarded You as holy. So change our souls and our understandings of Thee that immediately, like Saul, we will regard You as God and Christ as Your Son. For we ask it in His name. Amen.